in Michigan, a behavioral psychologist isolates pigeons inside experimental Skinner boxes. He uses a computer to both record and manipulate their behavior. At Harvard, a developmental psychologist uses human masks to study infant perceptual abilities. Developmental researchers at the University of Washington use a quite different device to chart basic human perceptual responses. In the heart of Africa, an ethologist observes and records chimpanzee behavior in the wild. In a university laboratory in California, chimpanzees are being taught the rudiments of language. Their learning abilities are first tested, then carefully recorded. surveys, statistical comparisons, case studies, and controlled experiments are examples of the many different research approaches psychologists use. As psychologists expand their quest for knowledge, the scope and diversity of research continues to grow. Underlying this diversity, however, are basic rules or methods common to all research. We will explore some of these now by looking at the psychologist and the experiment. In spite of the incredible diversity in what psychologists try to discover and how they try to discover it, they all share the same essential problem which researchers must face in all fields of science. That is, they must strive in every way possible to avoid the false conclusions which everyday common sense observations so often lead to. Because psychologists usually study behavior that is relatively complex, their problems are particularly acute. They must try to ensure that the phenomena they observe are in fact caused by the experimental conditions they manipulate. All psychologists who conduct experiments share basic methods in common. First, they must formulate the problem they hope to solve into a testable proposition or hypothesis. This may be part of a well-developed theory or simply a scientific hunch. Then, they must isolate the particular features of the environment they are interested in studying. Their interest is in determining how these environmental features affect behavior. Next, they must hold the rest of the environment constant while they manipulate or vary these features. Finally, they must accurately measure the effects of their manipulations on the behavior they are studying. By careful execution of each of these steps, psychologists can have greater confidence in their conclusions. The concept of control rests at the core of all experimental research. The amount of control an experimenter has over his subjects gives us one way to characterize the many kinds of research projects within the field of psychology. We can view these diverse studies in terms of a continuum of control. For example, laboratory researchers working with animals create the entire environment of their studies. They have virtually total control.
Ethological researchers observing animals in the field must try to guess which of many environmental factors are most important to their studies. In comparison, they have relatively little control. Most behavioral scientists strive for as much control as possible in conducting their research. However, as they move into the laboratory in search of more control, they increase the risk that their findings will not be applicable in the complex or uncontrolled real world. Even research projects using very different methods share the same basic logic for obtaining and interpreting their findings. We will explore what they share by viewing two very different experiments. One studying perceptual development in kittens, the other the effects of fear on college women. Okay, that will be enough for now. You can fill out the rest of those questionnaires later. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Gregor Zilstein of the Medical School's Departments of Neurology and Psychiatry. I've asked you here today in order to serve as subjects in an experiment concerned with the effects of electric shock. The increasing use of electroshock therapy and the increase in accidents involving electric shock make our studies in this area vital if we are to understand the permanent and temporary... As you may have guessed, the experiment we are watching has nothing to do with the effects of electric shock. It is actually a social psychology experiment. The fact that the researcher uses deception in explaining the nature of the experiment illustrates some of the complex problems of using humans as experimental subjects. Obviously, human subjects cannot be manipulated or controlled as rigidly as the experimental animals will see later. This experiment was designed by Dr. Stanley Schachter, currently visiting professor at University College London. Its real purpose is to measure the relationship between a person's degree of fear or anxiety and that person's need to affiliate or be with other people. In a very real sense, the entire enterprise of social psychology rests on the fact that people like to be together. They affiliate. From studying case histories of people who have been in total isolation for long periods of time, such as religious hermits or prisoners in solitary confinement, we knew that total isolation was a debilitating experience. It seemed to produce states of great anxiety and fear. And we made what I think was a plausible guess. We assumed that if isolation breeds anxiety and fear, it's conceivable then that the state of anxiety or fear would lead people to want to affiliate. So the hypothesis which led to the experiment was one of the conditions under which people will want to be together is when they are fearful or when they're anxious. Though you could try to test such a hypothesis in real life, it would be extraordinarily difficult to do so. Real life is simply too complex. There are too many variables operating. And the only way to obtain conclusive results, then, is to first isolate the variables you think are important, in this case, fear and affiliation. Second, manipulate these variables under control of conditions. And finally, accurately measure the effects of your manipulations. We manipulated the amount of fear, our independent variable, by having our fictitious Dr. Zilstein present a different description of shock to each of our two experimental groups. In the high fear condition, Dr. Zilstein described the shocks in very frightening terms. Now, I do want to be completely honest with you and tell you exactly what you are in for. These shocks will hurt. They will be painful. As you can guess, in research of this sort, if we are to learn anything that will be of help to humanity, it is necessary that our shocks be intense. And what we will do is put an electrode on your hand, hook you into an apparatus such as this, give you a series of electric shocks, and take various measures, such as pulse rate, blood pressure, and so on. Again, I do want to be honest with you that these shocks will be quite painful, but of course, they will do no permanent damage. Now, I assure you... 
The other experimental group was exposed to the low fear condition. We removed this ominous looking electrical junk from the room and Dr. Zilstein's explanation was modified considerably. I'm sure that you will enjoy the experiment. What we will ask you to do is very simple. We would like to give each of you a series of very mild electric shocks. Now I assure you that what you will feel will not in any way be painful. It will more resemble a tickle or a tingle than anything unpleasant. We will put an electrode on your hand, give you a series of very mild electric shocks, and measure such things as pulse rate and blood pressure, measures which I'm sure you're all familiar with from visits to your family doctor. Dr. Zilstein's two different descriptions of the effect of shock make up what is called the independent variable. This is the environmental condition that the experimenter manipulates. The experiment measures how this independent variable, the fear produced by the different descriptions of shock, affects the subject's desire to affiliate. It's important to point out that the subjects were assigned to either the high fear or low fear condition at random, completely by chance. Dr. Schachter would not want to make the assignments to the two conditions on the basis of how the girls looked or behaved. For example, if only the friendliest subjects were assigned to the high fear condition, their decision to affiliate could not be considered the sole result of the experimenter's manipulations. Thus, some girls were told to come at one time, others at another. But it was nothing about the girls that determined when they came or which condition they were exposed to. This random assignment to conditions is a crucial feature of all psychological experiments, for it allows the researcher to rule out individual differences as possible confounding factors in interpreting the results. After exposure to either the high fear or low fear description, the experimental procedure in both conditions was identical. Before we begin the actual shocking, there will be a 10 minute delay while we get this room in order. We have several pieces of equipment to bring in and set up. Now with this many people in the room, this would be difficult to do. So we're going to ask you to be kind enough to leave the room. Now here's what we would like you to do during this 10 minute period of delay. We have on this floor a number of additional rooms so that each of you, if you like, can wait alone in your own room. Now these rooms are spacious and comfortable. They all have armchairs and there are books and magazines in each. It does occur to us, however, that some of you might like to wait together for these few 10 minutes with some of the other girls here. We'll take one of the large empty classrooms and you can wait together there. Whatever you decide, just let us know by filling out the appropriate sections in these questionnaires. The experimenter then passed out two brief questionnaires. These were designed to measure not only the subject's preference for waiting alone or together, but the intensity of that preference. The subject's answers to these questionnaires represent the dependent variable. As in all psychological experiments, this is a measure of behavior which reflects the influence of the independent variable. The experiment studies how this behavior depends on the researcher's manipulation of the independent variable. Once all the questionnaires were completed, the experiment was essentially over. In review, Schachter's experimental design is elegantly simple. There are two groups of subjects, one group exposed to a high fear condition, the other group exposed to a low fear condition. These two conditions make up the independent variable. The assignment of subjects to these conditions is random. The subject's preferences for being alone or together, as measured by the questionnaire, make up the dependent variable. In addition, the intensity of the subject's preference was also measured. I should mention that the subjects weren't actually shocked. After they'd made their choice of together or alone, the experiment was over as far as we were concerned. 
Okay, now that I've got all the questionnaires, I have a surprise for you. We are not going to give you any electric shocks whatsoever. In fact, the experiment is over. And I should tell you that I am not a neurologist, but a social psychologist. And what we were really after were your responses to these questionnaires. Now, I'll explain the purpose of the experiment. Incidentally, the hypothesis was confirmed. The results showed that the subjects exposed to the high fear condition, especially those subjects who were the most fearful, chose to affiliate. They chose to wait together. It's important to point out that while this experiment was a success in the sense that the hypothesis was confirmed, this experiment was really just the beginning. From there on, we went to do numerous other experiments in order to try to find out what this relationship was all about, why were the subjects choosing together, what did they get out of it, and so on. Uh, the experiment has also been replicated many times by other experimenters who have examined other aspects of this particular relationship between fear and affiliation. This tiny kitten has been deprived of all light since birth. Now, after three months of total darkness, it begins the task of learning how to see. The kitten's performance in this experimental maze will help to clarify the process of visual development. John, this experiment is being carried out at the University of California, Riverside. Psychologist Austin Reason and his co-researcher, John Crabtree, work in the field of physiological psychology. All psychologists are interested in behavior. The physiological psychologist is particularly interested in internal mechanisms, the brain and the nervous system. We are really the biologists of psychology. The social psychologist, like Dr. Schachter, looks at the same individual from the outside behaving in a social setting. The physiological psychologist uh, tries to find out what the brain is doing. In my own case, I work with how the eyes and the brain work together. Many researchers who've worked in this field have provided information as to what aspects of visual development are inborn, and on the other hand, those that require experience. Much of the development that occurs on the basis of experience occurs within a rather short time early in development. We call this period the critical period. The current experiment is designed to tell us more about the critical period. When is it exactly? If it's missed, can recovery occur? And eventually is there a point from which uh, recovery becomes impossible? Now two of our major problems in designing our research were simplification and control. We use kittens because the structure and development of their visual system parallels that of humans in many ways. We cannot, nor would we want to, experiment with humans the same way that we can with animals. One fundamental way of doing the research would be to simply observe a developing kitten and note what it does visually. We would then attempt to formulate theories about the developmental process which were supported by our observations. Many researchers have contributed a great deal of knowledge in many areas of psychology using the techniques of observation and introspection. However, with virtually no control in our research situation, things would become quickly very complicated. That is because the kitten is developing in many ways at the same time. For example, it's developing visual abilities at the same time that it's developing motor abilities. Therefore, in order to simplify and control the situation, we use the classic experimental technique called sensory deprivation. We raise our experimental animals in total darkness from birth. This allows them to develop in every way except visually. We then bring the animals into the light and test them for visual abilities. All the groups, even these control kittens raised in the light, must be treated exactly the same 
except they are exposed to different levels of the independent variable. All kittens were fed the same food at the same time, were raised in exactly the same size cages, came from the same litters, and so on. The only difference in treatment was in whether or not they were deprived of light, and if so, for how long. This deprivation is the independent variable. The apparatus we used to test the kitten's visual abilities was originally designed by Dr. John Robinson and Stephen Fish. It is a series of walls with doors through which the cat must pass to reach the endpoint and receive a food reward. The walls are made up of black and white slats which present a fairly challenging visual environment to the kitten. I count the number of times the kitten reverses itself as it attempts to find its way through the maze, a measure I call pacing for short. This measure makes up the dependent variable. I check the accuracy of my scoring by validating it against the scores obtained by other observers. There are basically six groups of subject kittens in the experiment. These groups have been deprived of light for different lengths of time since birth. One month, two months, three months, and so on. These differing periods of deprivation are the different levels of the independent variable. Again, this is the environmental condition that the experimenter manipulates. In this experiment, how long each group stays in total darkness after birth. The experiment measures how this independent variable, the amount of visual deprivation since birth, affects the kitten's performance in the maze. Their performance is measured by counting the number of times the kitten reverses its direction as it makes its way through the maze. This measure of performance constitutes the dependent variable. Remember, the dependent variable is some behavior which the experiment is designed to measure. This behavior depends on the experimenter's manipulation of the independent variable. There are six other groups of kittens in this experiment, the control groups. These are normal kittens raised exactly like the deprived kittens, except they have not been deprived of light. Each control group is tested at an age corresponding to one of the experimental groups. Their participation in the experiment serves two functions. They set a standard of performance by which the deprived groups are judged. In other words, they tell us how normal kittens perform at different ages without deprivation. Also, their presence acts as a control for unforeseen variables. All the subject kittens were assigned to the various groups at random, completely by chance. Once again, this random assignment to conditions is a crucial feature of all psychological experiments, for it allows the researcher to rule out individual differences as possible confounding factors in interpreting the results. Now I'm starting a normal or control group kitten through the maze. Despite the fact that he is only two months old, too young to have achieved mature motor development, you can see that he negotiates the maze fairly quickly and with little pacing. This kitten, however, is from one of our experimental groups. He's five months old, three months older than the control kitten we just saw, which is quite a bit older in terms of a cat's development. But he spent those five months in total darkness. Except for some previous trial runs to introduce him to the maze and teach him that there is a food reward at the end, he's had no visual experience. As you can see, he's not doing so well. He's not yet able to negotiate the confusing visual patterns created by the maze.
Well, he had some problems. He did quite a bit of pacing. This compares with the relatively few problems the control kitten had. As you saw, the control kitten paced very little. The performances of all kittens in each experimental group are averaged and entered on a daily basis. The psychologist now uses statistics to tell him if the differences between the groups are reliable or significant. When the differences are very large, statistical analysis may not be required. However, when they are small, statistical analysis can tell the psychologist if the differences are meaningful or if they should be attributed to chance. Here's another kitten who was light deprived for five months. However, he's doing much better than our last subject. That's because he's had more practice. He's been out of the light longer than the previous kitten, and he's now rapidly developing his visual motor coordination. This experiment will hopefully provide us with valuable new information on the process of visual development but only by combining our data with further findings on brain chemistry and anatomy will the significance of these findings be uh, fully developed. Uh, you know, when this area of research was first launched a couple of decades ago, we did not really have any practical implications in mind. Uh, on the other hand, by now there are implications. The uh, operation for congenital cataracts is done earlier. Uh, bandaging is avoided for any long period of time, even after injury, because uh, this would uh, produce changes in the brain that would, might be very difficult to reverse. It's important to point out that even if this experiment is a success, in the sense that it uh, confirms our hypothesis, it will still only be a beginning. We here at UCR and other researchers around the country will go on to other experiments designed to further clarify this phenomenon. Also, this particular experiment may be replicated with certain modifications to answer additional questions. A crucial criterion for any experiment is replicability. Research must be able to be repeated and verified by other scientists for it to be considered valid. That is, for it to be taken seriously by the scientific community. Although the research projects we've just seen represent widely diverse fields of psychology, they share in common the basic principles of good experimental research. What these principles add up to is a way of ruling out alternative interpretations of what's being studied. Without experimental manipulation, it would be difficult to disentangle the causal relationships and to isolate the crucial conditions controlling behavior. In Dr. Schachter's experiment with college girls, it is plain that it was the fear-provoking conditions that encouraged the affiliation, rather than any pre-experimental friendliness between the girls. Similarly, the kitten's poor performance was due to the differences in visual deprivation, rather than to other conditions, such as differences in heredity. Our confidence in such conclusions rests on the experimental method. While much of the important research in psychology is conducted under conditions of much less control, these techniques of experimental management provide the most effective methods science has yet devised for discovering and isolating the complex factors affecting behavior.